Let's bow together in prayer. Our Father, we approach you this morning in gratitude, first of all and foremost, for the clarity and the simplicity of the scriptures which teach us in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. Father, you have shown your grace to us so wondrously by letting us know, giving us your word, letting us know what it is we are here for, who it is we are accountable to. You've revealed this to us. We thank you, Father, for the ministries of Answers in Genesis, for Ken Ham, for other similar ministries that uphold this truth and who make it their business to assist churches and Christians and pastors to continue to uphold this truth in this day and in this age when it seems it is under attack relentlessly without stopping. Father, we do thank you for the truth this morning. Thank you, Father, for each one that is here, for pastors that are here representing churches that still stand for this truth, have never wavered from it, have never diluted it, have never watered it down. Father, may today, this hour, be another time when we are strengthened in that resolve. The ministry of Brother Ham this morning to continue to encourage us, and Father, to strengthen us as we go forth from here. And Father, we would pray this morning as we thank you for the clarity of your message, that you would also give us opportunity to make it known to those around us so that those that are in darkness now might see the light of the truth, not just through the written word of God, but the living word, Jesus Christ. We thank you for all of this and ask your guidance and your help for this hour and for our speaker. In the name of Jesus, our Lord, our creator, we pray. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. Well, welcome to the second day of the Joseph K. Pinter Lecture Series. Had wonderful um, lectures yesterday, and if you uh, hopefully got a program when you came in. So just brief information here um, on this about uh, both Dr. Pinter, the namesake of the lecture series, as well as Ken Ham here. Um, this, you know, this, this bio, if you will, does not do justice to um, Ken Ham's ministry, and uh, he's, he has uh, been a great asset to Christianity and churches and pastors and throughout not only this country, but uh, throughout the world. Ken's emphasis is on the relevance of authority of the book of Genesis to the life of the average Christian and how compromise on Genesis has opened a dangerous door regarding how the culture and church view biblical authority. And we saw a good a good foundation and basis of that yesterday in those those lecture series. So we're, we're halfway done. So again, thank you for being here. And we still have the seven o'clock session tonight to be part of. So brother. Well, good morning. It's uh, great to be with you all again. And uh, as Dr. Anderson already advertised uh, this morning, uh, we're making these books, uh, the, the, some of the basic materials that we have available to you. We, our publisher does this for colleges like this only, and you can get them at that highly subsidised price. And we'll let that go for anyone in the room here uh, this morning, uh, some of the basic materials we have so that you can be equipped. By the way, did I tell you we're looking for seasonal staff for the summer and uh, we need as much help as we can. And actually, we would love to have people from colleges like ABC because we want high quality young people who not only can come and minister to those at our attractions but also be impacted by them as well. And that's the Ark Encounter and the Creation Museum, the two leading Christian themed attractions in the world. And uh, this, actually this summer, the combined total attendance since we first opened the Creation Museum and then together with the Ark will be over 10 million people have visited uh, those facilities. So, so we certainly praise the Lord for that. Well, we've been covering a, a variety of topics associated with the authority of Scripture and where our culture is at today. And today I'm going to deal with this one, the six days uh, of creation and dealing with uh, the age of the earth. Does it really matter? Uh, that's uh, a really important question because so many, I find so many pastors even, and churches will say, 
Well, it, it doesn't really matter. What does it matter if you believe in six days? What's that got to do with the gospel or anything like that? But there's a much bigger issue that I want to really address, and that's what I've been saying the whole time. And our focus of a ministry is not on the age of the earth or the days of creation. It's on the authority of Scripture. And out of that flows what we stand on. And so when asking the question, does it really matter, here's how I believe we should be asking the question. Does it really matter if we take God at his word? Because that's what really matters. And that's why we had that meditation verse this morning from Proverbs verse 30, uh, chapter 30, verses 6. And so read verse 5 there. Every word of God is pure. And then verse 6, do not add to his words. I believe one of the problems we have in the church is so many have added to the word of God, taking the fallible word of man and adding it to the word of God. And so when it comes to the issue of the six days of creation, I would say, number one, it's an authority issue. And that's what we're going to really deal with this morning, mainly that aspect of it. Now, number two, it's an indirect salvation issue. We already really dealt with that uh, last night, and I'll sort of briefly explain that again today at the end. And number three, it's a gospel issue, and we really dealt with that as well. So we really dealt with number two and three yesterday, maybe not in those words, but I'll sort of bring it together for you. But I mainly want to concentrate on this one here. It's an authority issue. You know, it's interesting at the Creation Museum or the Ark Encounter, uh, we have a lot of secular media that visit us, and mostly when they ask questions, you know, you, you, they can be standing there in front of this massive Ark or at the Creation Museum seeing all the exhibits, and then they'll turn to me and they'll say, why do you people believe in a young earth? You know, why do you believe in six days of creation? Uh, they don't want to ask about anything else. See, it seems like that's such a big issue to them. In fact, one of the things I've noticed is that when newspaper reports are written about us, and it happens quite a lot, it's almost as if the media have this paragraph they always paste in there. You know, Ken Ham from Answers in Genesis, or the Answers in Genesis, you know, reached a milestone of attendance today or something. These are the people that believe in six literal days in a young earth and believe dinosaurs are on the ark and reject science. You know, that's the paragraph they have. They paste it in every time. They think that by uh, actually telling people that we believe in a young earth and six literal days of creation, it's sort of belittling us in a way. You know, secularists believe in millions of years, but you know they have to. Think about it. If you don't have the millions of years then how do you explain life? If you don't have millions of years for evolution, what are you going to do? Are you going to believe in the Bible? No, they don't want to do that. They've got to have the millions of years. That's why it's such an emotional issue for them. I've even seen Richard Dawkins on television and you know, with someone who doesn't believe in uh, biological evolution or anthropological evolution, and you know, he'll sort of be negative with them and so on. But as soon as they say they don't believe in millions of years, it's almost like he goes ballistic because they've got to have the millions of years. 1954, George Wald was an American biochemist, received a Nobel Prize for physiology and in medicine. He made this statement, time is in fact the hero of the plot. What we regard as impossible on the basis of human experience is meaningless here. Given so much time, the impossible becomes possible, the possible uh, probable, and the probable virtually certain. One has to only wait. Time itself performs the miracles. See, time is almost like their God. They've got to have time. I mean, think about this. How do you try to convince someone that an impossible process has occurred? Because and it's an impossible process that you don't observe. How, how do you convince someone today that ape like creatures turned into people? We don't see that happening. How do you convince someone that life arose in some primeval soup millions of years ago? We don't see that happening. We don't see reptiles turning into birds today. We don't see that happening. How do you convince someone that it happened? Given enough time, anything happens. Time itself performs the miracles. You know, we make no apology at Answers in Genesis Ministry, the Creation Museum, the Ark Encounter, that we believe that God created in six literal days uh, just a few thousand years ago. We don't believe in the millions of years. Now, I've had Christians say to me, well, wait a minute, where in the Bible does it say God created everything 6,000 years ago? Well, it doesn't. And I'm glad it doesn't, because if it did, we'd have a problem. You realize why that is so? Well, because the written word was basically completed, what, 2,000 years ago. So if it said 6,000 years was the age of everything, well, now it would be 8,000 years, right? See, see, God doesn't give us a specific age, 
But you know what he does give us? Very detailed history to enable us to work it out. You see, if God created everything in six literal days, we're going to come back to that and we're going to say, yes, he did. And we know that Adam was created on day six. And then as we read through those genealogies, you know, Adam had a son, Seth, at 130. Seth had a father, Enosh, at 105. Enosh fathered Kenan at 90. And uh, then it goes on, Kenan fathered um, Halal 70, and he fathered Jared at 65, he fathered Enoch at 162, he fathered Methuselah at 65, he fathered Lamech at 187, he fathered Noah at 182, Noah fathered Ham, Shem, and Japheth. You come to the time of Abraham, to the time of God's son steps into history, Jesus Christ the God-man, up to today, and you come to what? 6,000 years. That's where we get the 6,000 years from. In other words, it's from starting from Scripture, letting God speak to us, but that is certainly taking those days as ordinary days. And that's the big issue because you can't put millions of years into the genealogies. So if you're going to try to fit millions of years into the Bible, uh, you're going to have to fit it in before Adam. And so that's why you find all these different views that we talked about yesterday in regard to Genesis. So, but if those days are six ordinary days then you can come to no other conclusion than the earth and the universe is only about 6,000 years old, not millions of years old. And so we really need to do a little study on those six days, first of all. The Hebrew word for day is the word yom. So what does it mean? Well, I've had, uh, I was talking with a pastor once and he said, but the word day can mean something other than an ordinary day. And I said, yes, but it can also mean an ordinary day. He said, but it can mean something other than an ordinary day. I said, yes, but it can also mean an ordinary day. And he said, but it, but it can mean something other than an ordinary day. <laughs> and so the argument goes on. And I said, yes, but it can also mean an ordinary day. And the point is not that it can mean something other than an ordinary day. The point is, what does it mean in that context? And the interesting thing is, the major meaning of the word day is actually day. I knew you'd be you know, surprised at that, but that's what it is. You know, most words have two or more meanings depending upon context. Think about that. Context determines the meaning. For instance, I could say some of you were sitting at the back and you came back after being here yesterday and you have a sore back and you're resting your back against the back of the chair. Well, there's the word back with a few different meanings. But context enables you to understand what I mean by those, right? Well, the word day is like that. In English, we have different meanings of the word day. Back in my father's day means time, back in my father's time. It took 10 days, usually um, when you say that, you're saying you know, 10, 24-hour days, to drive across the Australian outback uh, during the day. Well, when you say during the day, you usually mean the daylight portion of the day. So when we use the word day in everyday English, the context determines uh, what it means. I'll see you again someday. You're not pointing to a specific day, it's, a, it's time. And you know, the Hebrew word uh, yom has a range of meanings similar to uh, the range of meanings we have for the English word day. And for instance, in the book of Isaiah, or Isaiah, as you incorrectly, no, which way do you say it? Isaiah, isn't that it? Isaiah? Anyway, whatever it is, it's wrong. Uh, so, <laughs> the day of the Lord is near, that means the time, the day of the captivity of the Lord, the day that the Lord made the heavens and the earth. In other words, there's Genesis 2.4 saying in the day that God created, but the word day there means time. It's not talking about a specific day of creation. You see, the Hebrew word for day is used 2,301 times in the Old Testament in the singular and plural form. Here's the interesting thing. Do you realize we know what the word day, everywhere, everywhere it's used, we know what it means except Genesis 1. Why is Genesis 1 always the issue. I want you to think about that for a moment. I mean, you don't hear anyone saying, how long did Joshua take to march around Jericho? Was it a million years? Was it a hundred thousand years? I mean, we know what the word day means there, right? We don't argue about the word day anywhere else in the Old Testament, but we argue about the word day in Genesis 1. Why is Genesis 1 singled out? There's only one reason. Because of the issue of millions of years that comes from the world. That's what it's all about, people trying to fit the millions of years in. You know the question we should be asking ourselves? When does the word yom mean an ordinary day? When does it mean an ordinary day? And so one of the things we can do is some research and look up some respected Hebrew dictionaries like this Hebrew lexicon. 
And uh, this particular one here, uh, Brown Dover Briggs, is probably one that you probably even use at this college. I mean, it's one of the ones often used in Bible colleges and seminaries. And uh, it, if, you, if you look it up, you'll, you'll find uh, that um, the it, day defined by evening and morning, and it gives you those particular examples. And that's when the word day means an ordinary day. And by the way, uh, you'll see that it's talking about the, the days of creation. There's a, a more modern uh, Hebrew lexington by Kola Baumgartner, and this particular one here even has a specific heading for number two. It has all the different meanings of the word day. It says day of 24 hours. In Genesis 1, 5, the first day of creation is specifically uh, given there. And so what I'm saying is if you look up respected Hebrew dictionaries, the example of when day means an ordinary day is given as the days of creation in Genesis chapter 1. So why is that? Let's look at the contextual usage here. So whenever the word day is qualified by a number, 410 times we found, uh, outside of Genesis 1, so this is hiving off Genesis 1 and the rest of the Old Testament, it always means an ordinary day. Whenever you have the phrase evening and morning without the word day, 38 times, it always means an ordinary day. Whenever you have evening or morning with the word day, it works out to be 23 times each, it means an ordinary day. And whenever you have night with day, it means an ordinary day. So therefore, if, if you've got day qualified with number or evening or morning, or you have the phrase evening and morning or day qualified with night, then it means an ordinary day. So it, it must be very difficult to work out what the word day means from Genesis 1 because so many of our Christian leaders don't know what it means. And so let's have a look at how hard it really is. So Genesis chapter 1, for the first day, night, evening, morning, day. And then for the others, evening, morning, number, day, evening, morning, number, day. You know I'm getting a very strong hint about something as I go through here. You know to me it's almost as if God is saying, uh, now... These people in the 21st century are going to be so thick. I'm going to qualify the word day over and over and over again, and they're still not going to believe it because they don't really want to believe my word. Because our sin nature problem, which goes back to Genesis 3.1, is that we would rather question the word of God and believe the word of man. Think about the temptation that was given uh, to Adam and Eve. Did God really say... And the devil uses the same method on us as we talked about yesterday uh, that from 2 Corinthians 11.3 as a warning to us. But that really sums up the sin nature of man. We would rather trust the word of man than the word of God. That, that's our problem. We should always be cognizant of the fact that each one of us is going to have that issue. Our bias because of our sin nature is that we won't want to believe the word of God. And that's why you need to be so very careful about whether we're taking man's word to the Bible or we're letting God's word speak to us. So I'm saying in Genesis 1, if you take it as written in the context, the word day there means an ordinary day. Now, think about this. Where do we get the idea of the week from? The day, the rotation of the earth and its axis, the month, the earth and the moon, the year, the earth and the sun. Where does the seven-day week come from? The Bible. In fact, Exodus 20, verse 11, the basis of the fourth commandment. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth and the sea and all that in, the, in them is. God made everything in six days and rested for one. In fact, that's where our seven-day week comes from. When I'm doing kids' programs, I say if, if God created everything in six millions of years and rested for millions of years, we'd have an interesting week, wouldn't we? We'd never have to do our homework. We could say we're in the millions of years rest right now. So if you have a teacher that doesn't believe in six literal days, you don't need to do your homework. So there you are. Well, then I have Christians who have all sorts of objections, right? They say, now, wait a minute, wait a minute. I hear this all the time. How can those days be ordinary days when um, you don't have the sun until day four, if you take Genesis as literal history? How can you have day and night without the sun? You know the first thing I say to those people? Before I even answer that, if this is the word of God and we're letting the word speak to us, Regardless of an objection, objection we might have, shouldn't we be looking at what the word means in context? And if it means an ordinary day, it's an ordinary day, regardless of whether we have an objection or think that there's something wrong here. In other words, are we taking God at his word or not? That's number one. That's always number one. So before I even answer that objection, 
I point them to the fact, wait a minute, if we're taking this as written, the word in context, these are ordinary days, regardless of what you're saying. That's how I believe we as Christians should be looking at this. But number two, you don't need the sun for day and night. For day and night, you need light and darkness. You need a rotating earth. What have we got on day one? In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and the earth was out form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God moved upon the waters, and God said, let there be. And there was light, and he divided the light from thee. And there was evening and morning, one day, the first day, defining actually a day as uh, evening and morning. And then people say to me, well, where'd the light come from? I don't know. God didn't tell me. And I've had people say to me, well, why doesn't God tell us? If God told us everything, we'd have an infinite number of books and we'd never get through them. God's given us the information he wants us to have. He's not going to give us all information. We can't have all information. We're finite beings. Only God is infinite knowledge and wisdom. People, we, we, can, we can never learn everything there is to know because we're finite beings. So there's that aspect of, as I said yesterday, when you believe in God, you have to believe in the supernatural. I mean, that's the bottom line. There are things you're not going to understand. There are things we won't have answers to because he is God. You know who learned that lesson was Job. Remember how Job was talking to his friends and talking about all that was going on and so on, and then God says, Job, let me ask you some questions. Do you know this? Do you know that? Do you know this? Do you know that? Do you know this? Do you know that? Do you know this? And in the end, what happens? Job repents in dust as ashes and said, now I see you as who you really are. You know all things. He realized, I know nothing compared to God. Nothing. See, that's what really gets me about these people that compromise God's word. I'm thinking, here they are. The, the only one who knows everything is God. We know nothing. We're finite beings. We have sinful hearts. Our bias is against the truth anyway. And, and we want to impose what we believe on God's word. How dare we? How arrogant of us to do that. You know, it's interesting that um, when the sun was made, it says uh, the sun and the moon were made for stars, uh, for, for signs and for seasons. And the sun and the moon were made to rule the day and the night that already existed because God had made them and so now they were to rule the day. And I often wonder if one of the reasons God did this is because down through the ages we notice so many people have tended to worship the sun, like the Egyptians who worship the sun and so on. And I think God is saying, no, the sun is my tool. I made everything. I control everything. And then I made the sun to be my tool. Don't worship the sun. Worship the God who made the sun. I think that's what's very, very important. I mentioned yesterday that there are so many Christian leaders I find that say, well, what's wrong believing in the Big Bang? Because if you believe in the Big Bang, in the beginning God created. Isn't that the Big Bang? Well, the answer is no, because the Big Bang is an idea that comes out of naturalism to try to explain the universe without God. And uh, the Big Bang has the stars coming and then the sun and then the earth is a hot molten blob that cools down over millions of years, and then stars supposedly keep forming. Let's take what the Bible says. God created the earth first, not as a hot molten blob, but covered with water, and the sun and the moon and the stars weren't made until day four after the earth, so it doesn't fit. And then, of course, the Big Bang has everything dying, a heat death getting colder and colder. If you want to talk about a Big Bang, I guess you could quote Second Peter 3, because uh, God's going to come back one day and there's going to be a new heavens and new earth and uh, it, it, it's going to be judged with fire. So that's the Big Bang, if you really want a Big Bang. And then I have these people in our churches. Oh, they drive me crazy, actually. Because they'll come up to me and say, well, the Bible says uh, a day is like a thousand years. And, you know, I'm sitting, I'm sitting there thinking, oh, good grief, I feel like punching them in the nose. See, just remember, you don't know what I'm thinking some of the times when you're asking questions. Uh, so, but they, they say, the Bible says a day's like a thousand years. Surely those days in, in Genesis aren't ordinary days. Wait a minute, where are you getting that from? And primarily it's from 2 Peter chapter 3, sort of similar statement in Psalm 90, but 2 Peter chapter 3 is what they're really quoting. A day is like a thousand years, and is what they say. 
And I say, well, do you read the rest of the verse? And it says a thousand years are like a day. That just cancels that one right out. You're taking the first bit or you're taking the second bit? And besides which, you just misquoted scripture. What do you mean? It doesn't say a day is like a thousand years. It says one day is with the Lord as a thousand years. What's that mean? To God, a day is like a thousand years or a thousand years are like a day. To God, it's got nothing to do with the days of creation. Besides which, you can't take a phrase from the New Testament and use it to determine the meaning of a Hebrew word in Genesis. That's ridiculous. You can't do that. And the context of 2 Peter 3 is what? The second coming. In the last days, scoffers will come, walking out their own lusts and saying, where is the promise of his coming? And what, what's God saying? Uh, he's saying there, oh, these scoffers might be scoffing because Jesus hasn't come back. I mean, it's been 2,000 years since he came as the God-man on earth. See, he's not going to come back. Ah, wait a minute. It's not his will that any should perish. To God, a day is like a 1,000 years, and a 1,000 years is like a day. He is long-suffering, it says. That's the context of all of this. It has nothing to do with the days of creation, which is why I want to punch them in the nose, but I don't. And... I have to repent of my sin of thinking about that. And, you know, the other thing is, I, I said, besides which, if the days were a 1,000 years, 6,000 years isn't going to help you when you want millions of years to try to add in the Bible. That doesn't even make any sense. And you know the other thing I noticed? They always take that and apply it to Genesis 1. If they were consistent, wouldn't they do it everywhere else? I mean, wouldn't they say, well, Jonah was obviously in the fish 3,000 years. You know, a day is like a 1,000 years. No, they don't do that there. They're so inconsistent. Do you realise a lot of these things people just quote they heard somebody say, you start to analyse it and you realise how ridiculous it is. They're, they're not thinking logically. They, because to them, it means they don't have to believe God's word and be mocked for not believing in millions of years. They just grab at those things. You know, I like what Martin Luther said. You know, in Martin Luther's day, he had a problem. And that some of the church fathers believed God created in less than six days. It only took one day. And so here's what Martin Luther said. When Moses writes that God created heaven and earth and whatever is in them in six days, then let this period continue to have been six days, and then I'll venture to devise any comment according to which six days were one day. But if you cannot understand how this could have been known six days, then grant the Holy Spirit the honour of being more learned than you are. You know, that's, that really fits with what I said before. Only God knows everything. We know nothing compared to what God knows. But then people say, okay, okay, so there's six ordinary days. So why does it matter? I mean, what's wrong with believing in millions of years? Uh, who cares? Shouldn't we be more interested in the moral issues, which we talked about yesterday particularly, or interested in preaching the gospel? But just a little summary. Remember what I did yesterday? And, uh, oh, actually it was last night. Uh, specifically, uh, that I did this. I said, the era we live in, the era we live in began in the 1800s. And in the 1800s, there were atheists who wanted to explain everything by natural processes, who said, we don't believe in the flood of Noah's day, so the fossil layers were laid down over millions of years before man. And then what happened was that church leaders started to say, okay, we'll take that based on naturalism, like people take the Big Bang today based on naturalism, and we'll add it to the Bible. So Thomas Chalmers, the founder of the Free Church of Scotland, invented the gap theory that became prevalent in our churches, fitting the millions of years into the Bible, between a gap supposedly between Genesis 1, 1 and 1, 2. Others fitted in the days of creation and reinterpreted the days of creation. So this started happening in the 1800s, and along comes Darwin with his ideas of evolution, and so God used evolution. So the gap theory and the day-age theory, all these different views, theistic evolution started to arise in the church. God supposedly used the Big Bang when that idea came along. And I showed that all these different views started to rise in the church, all compromised positions. And one thing I said yesterday was this, just as a reminder, and they all have one thing in common, trying to take man's millions of years, which he desperately needs to try to explain life without God, and fitting it into the Bible. You see, it's an issue of authority because you're undermining the authority of the Word of God you're adding to the word of God instead of taking God at his word. Now, I showed you a whole series last night of clips from William Lane Craig, his professor at uh, Talbot Theological Seminary and, uh, with Biola and uh, Houston Baptist University and so on. And I want to show you all those clips again. I just want to show you the first one again, just to remind us what he said and talk about that real briefly. How old is the world? 
best estimates today are around 13.7 billion years or so. Now, this is good. You see, I, I, this is a position I can embrace because there are people who, who will sit here and say, no, it's six and a half thousand years old. Um, that, that is not a tenable position? I don't think it's plausible. Uh, mm -hmm. the, the arguments that I give are right in line with mainstream science. Uh, I'm not bucking up against mainstream science. And you remember, then I showed the other clips where I said, once you start adding to scripture and once you start reinterpreting God's word using man's ideas in the outside, what does it lead to with William Lane Craig? He rejects Genesis, rejects a literal Adam and Eve, mocks at those who believe in Adam and Eve. And unfortunately, that's permeated so much uh, of our Christian academia and most of our Christian colleges, seminaries, Bible colleges, compromise Genesis. There's only a minority that make the stand that ABC does here. There's a few, few colleges um, Bible, uh, seminaries and uh, universities that take the stand we do at Answers in Genesis, but not that many. And you're really privileged, actually, to be able to come uh, to a college like this to take such a stand on, on God's Word. But notice how he used the word science, and I talked about that yesterday. And when I debated Bill Nye, I said, we've got to understand the difference between uh, talking about the past and talking about the present, because the word science means knowledge. And experimental or observational science is when you're using your five senses in the present, and that builds technology, right? And we can all agree on that. It doesn't matter whether you're an evolutionist or a creationist. We can do good observational science. But when it comes to knowledge about the past, when you weren't there, ah, that's where the disagreement is, because evolutionists, uh, secularists, are saying that they believe life evolved and so on, but as Christians we're saying, no, God has told us what happened in his word, and therein is the big difference. And here is another warning to us to see what's really happening in the church. Some of you might have heard of an organization called BioLogos, which has really infiltrated many of our seminaries, even a lot of our conservative seminaries, unfortunately, because they, they are funded by the John Templeton Foundation. They've got millions of dollars, and they say, we want to come in and, and, and run a science and scripture series for you, and you'll get all this money and so on, and all be paid for. But if you have a look at the mission of BioLogos, here's their mission. They invite the church and the world to see the harmony between science and biblical faith. What do they mean by science, by the way? Well, they tell you in the next line, as we present an evolutionary understanding of God's creation. And what they believe, we believe the diversity and interrelation of all life on earth are best explained by the God-ordained process of evolution and common descent. Thus, evolution is not in opposition to God, but a means by which God providentially achieves his purposes. In other words, here's an organization set up, funded by a foundation that gives us millions of, years, millions of dollars. In fact, John Pendleton, who set up that foundation, was an extremely liberal uh, person in the church. And they fund the liberal causes. And that's how some of these seminaries get millions of dollars for various things. And it's very, very sad. And I wanted to give you an example here as a warning to what's happening in our Christian colleges. I already warned you about William Lane Craig and his organization, Reasonable Faith, that has permeated many Christian institutions in America. And he's looked on as some, uh, you know, with great esteem, and yet he's destructive to Christianity, I believe. Um, so let's look at a college like Wheaton College, which is held up as a great Christian college in America. They were given $3 million to be able to develop a textbook associated with BioLogos. And in fact, on the BioLogos website, it was announced in 2019. We're thrilled to announce the release of an important new book, Understanding Scientific Theories of Origins, Cosmology, Geology, Biology, and a Christian Perspective. This book is a textbook. It was written by five Wheaton College professors, the fruit of a three-year grant they received from BioLogos. And they're trying to get that textbook used in colleges uh, across the nation. Now, one of the authors of this textbook, a man called John Walton, uh, he actually was at Moody for 20 years, and uh, he's one that's really popularized this idea that Genesis was written against the, the Near Eastern uh, myths and so on. So they do not have the same view of the inspiration of Scripture as we do, or of what Scripture really is. And yet a lot of seminaries and Christian colleges, universities, are using John Walton's textbooks. But I want to show you a summary of what John Walton and the others have in this textbook that they're trying to get colleges to use across the nation. First of all, this statement, a Bible-first approach devalues the meaningfulness of creation at Revelation. I've got news for you. At Answers in Genesis, we have a Bible-first approach. 
In other words, we take God at his word, we let his word speak to us in the context of the literature, the language, grammatical, historical, interpretive method, uh, letting him speak to us. But they have to say that because if you have a Bible-first approach, then you can't believe in evolution in millions of years. They say the age of the earth, now understood to be 4.55 billion years, is really less a theory than it is a measurement. In other words, it is fact, right? Billions of years, fact. But it's not fact. That's an interpretation based on all sorts of assumptions and so on. And as, just as a reminder, what I said yesterday, if you believe in millions of years, you believe all the fossil layers were laid down millions of years before man, but those fossil layers are full of evidence of diseases like cancer, arthritis and so on. It's full of death. The Bible makes it very clear. Everything God created was very good. It's sin that caused death and disease. And notice this. If you're going to believe in millions of years, like these Wheaton College professors do, if you're going to believe in millions of years, you've got all this death before man, then you, well, you would have to deny the fall caused a problem, right? You'd have to deny that the groaning world is because of the fall. Well, here's a statement from their textbook. Although some Christians have argued that the fall utterly disrupted some kind of original perfection of creation, there is no evidence from either the Bible or the creation making that a foregone conclusion. No evidence from the Bible? How about the whole of creation groans because of sin? You see, they have to do that because once you've got millions of years, then what did the fall do? Because the millions of years of death and suffering, it's been here for millions of years. They go on, you think about it. If you're going to say those layers were laid down over millions of years, you can't believe in a global flood. Because if you believe in a global flood, it would have ripped them all up and redeposited them. So you've got to reject a global flood. Here it is enough to say that the geological data to support a flood of massive proportion is lacking. There is no archaeological evidence lends support to such a flood. Yeah, all you find are billions of dead things buried in rock layers laid down by water all over the earth. There's no evidence for a flood. See, they say there's evidence for millions of years. Now, if you've rejected a literal fall and you're rejecting a literal Adam and Eve and you're taking man's ideas of evolution, well, how did humans arise? Well, here's their statement. Humans are hominoid primates. You know what a hominoid primate is? An ape. We are apes. In the hominid tribe with cognitive abilities that exceed those of all other primates, evidenced by our ever-advancing technology, cultural innovations, and adaptability to different environments. That's the reason we're, we're a little better than the other apes, in their opinion, because we're a little cognitively you know, more advanced. How about we're made in the image of God? How about we're not apes, that man was made from dust and woman from his side? And you know, I'm going to talk tonight on the on one race issue, that we all go back to Adam and Eve, we're all one race. And uh, we already talked about marriage yesterday and the creation of man from dust and woman from his side, the first marriage, and so on. And of course, it's interesting. Once you deny Genesis, remember what I said last night? Genesis 1 to 11 is a foundation for everything. We talked about gender, we talked about marriage, we talked about abortion, these issues. When you go to a college like Wheaton, you will find they are very pro LGBT and, and, and very pro abortion and all these sorts of issues. Uh, because once you give up Genesis 1 to 11, you've got no foundation then for your worldview other than the secular worldview. That's really what happens. Well, let me um, you know, look at scripture here. The waters prevailed so mightily on the earth that all the high mountains under the whole heaven were covered. The waters prevailed above the mountains, covering them 15 cubits deep. Yeah, there's no evidence from the Bible it was a global flood. You read that, it makes it so obvious. But they reject that. But just so you know, I'm not just picking on William Lane Craig. Um, I mean, they've made public statements. We can make these. Wheaton College has published that textbook. We can, they make these statements, so we can talk about them. Well, just to show you another example, Dr. John Collins. Now, his textbooks are used widely in seminaries and Bible colleges, universities across America. Dr. Collins is professor of Old Testament at Covenant Theological Seminary in St. Louis, Missouri. It's really the denominational seminary of the uh, PCA if you like, the Presbyterian uh, Church. And he's one of the ESV translators, actually. Okay. And do you think that the flood was universal or um, in terms of wiping out all of humanity or, or not? Um, I, I, I would like to think so. Um, it's, there, there's places where you get a little bit uncertain. Um, how long ago uh, did it take place be becomes a, a question. Uh, and I don't, think, I don't think there's any answer to that. Um, 
but um, you, you do find hints in some uh, uh, ancient expositors the, uh, of the possibility that others besides Noah and his family survived the flood. Uh, Josephus, for example, talks about that. Uh, and Josephus is a Jewish writer in the towards the end of the first century. Let me ask you a question. Is the writings of Josephus on a par with scripture? No. So when asked about the flood, there could have been more people survived the flood because, of, because Josephus says. Does anyone see a problem here? Who's, who's his authority? He doesn't have the same view of scripture as we do. See, here's what Josephus said. I looked it up. There is a great mountain in Armenia um, upon which it is reported that many who fled at the time of the deluge were saved. Well, we know that's fiction. How do we know that? Well, what does the Bible tell us? The Bible tells us in Genesis, all flesh died that moved on the earth, all the beasts, swarming creatures, and so on, all mankind. First Peter tells us that only eight were brought safely through the water. And of course, when you read the account in Genesis 9, oh, there was Noah and his wife, their three sons and their three wives, they came off the ark. And notice something else there. In verse 19, we'll talk about that tonight. These three were the sons of Noah. From these, the people of the whole earth were dispersed. So everyone's a descendant of the three sons of Noah. Nobody else. Only eight people survived. But here's a man highly respected. His textbook's used in colleges across America. And here he is putting Josephus above God's word. People, that's the problem with the church. That's the problem with a lot of our colleges today. And let me give you just another example. I've got enough of these for the rest of the day, but, which is pretty sad when you think about it. So um, let's take a well-known pastor who has, I think it's the second largest church now in America, uh, in Atlanta. His name is Andy Stanley. We really believe, whether you take it literally or figuratively, whatever, if we really believe that God is the creator of the universe, that all time, space, and matter, all time, space, and matter were created by God, and we take seriously what science has told us, that it all began with a singularity. That's what it's referred to. Right before, there's not such thing as before the Big Bang because before is time and time began. So if we go to the singularity that was the Big Bang, that unfurled the universe, that continues to expand. Notice he just accepts it without question, right? And when religion and science conflict, at the end of the day, if you are an honest person, science must win. So people don't realize what's going on in the church, what's going on in our colleges, seminaries. And, and people, unfortunately, a lot of uh, parents are spending tens of thousands of dollars sending their unsuspecting uh, kids to these places and wonder why they walk away from the church. You know, the scripture, when the trumpet gives an uncertain sound, who will prepare for the battle? When, when they blew on, on, on that trumpet, uh, when, when the shofar, uh, there was a particular uh, sounds for particular things, but it meant advance or whatever it was, but they could hear the clear signal and know what to do. And unfortunately, the church today is not giving that clear signal because much of the church is saying, well, we're not sure what we believe about Genesis or even marriage or abortion or you can believe in millions of years or evolution. Well, we don't know. The days of creation. No wonder there's such confusion out there. No wonder we see what I showed yesterday with the decline in church attendance as we see going down to here to the millennials, only 18%. You go up to the greatest generation, 56%. Before that was 70%. And now we've even seen down to uh, the Generation Z and the Millennials, we're down to about 11.3%. People, we're seeing a catastrophic effect in the church because the leaders didn't take a stand on God's word. They compromised with the world. It's no different to what happened in the time of the prophets, if you go back and have a look. The people, the leaders who took the pagan religion and compromised it with God's word and look how it destroyed the people. You know, I like what Martin Luther said. The days of creation were ordinary days in length. We must understand that these days were actual days contrary to the opinion of the Holy Fathers. Whenever we observe that the opinions of the Fathers disagree with Scripture, we reverently bear with them, acknowledge them to be our elders. Nevertheless, we do not depart from the authority of Scripture for their sake. And you know, when people make comments to me about William Lane Craig or Andy Stanley or Wheaton College or whatever, I say, regardless, we will not depart from the authority of Scripture for their sake. And that's how it should be. And then, now I've already done this, why is it an indirect salvation issue? 
It's an indirect salvation issue because once you take man's ideas from outside the Bible and you start to question God's word, which is exactly what happened in Genesis 3, did God really say the Genesis 3 attack, which was the attack on the word of God, and as Paul warns us, the devil's going to use the same attack on us, and he does. And what's really happened is much of the church has allowed generations to doubt the word of God uh, beginning in Genesis because the Genesis 3 attack of the 19th, 20, 21st century is really this issue of the age of the earth, millions of years, that really started that decline. And then a gospel issue, well, a gospel issue because God created everything very good, uh, but we know sin entered the world, death as a result of sin. And uh, so we talked yesterday about uh, the fact that if you believe in millions of years, then you've got death, bloodshed, disease, and suffering before sin. Then when God said everything is very good, he's calling cancer very good. It's an attack on the character of God. And if death is not the penalty for sin, why did Jesus die on a cross? It's really undermining the entire gospel. It's an authority issue. It's an indirect salvation issue. It's a gospel issue. It's the continuing Genesis 3 battle between God's word and man's word. And that's what I really wanted to get across to us today. I wanted to get across to us today how important it is for us uh, to make sure that we take God at his word. And the book Six Days does a lot more detail in regard to that. And again, I want to remind you that we cover all these issues in various ways in these uh, books that I think are key books, core resources for you that you can get from our publisher at those really highly discounted prices. And of course, I have a lot of information about the days of creation and the whole of Genesis 1 to 11 in the new commentary that was just produced and it's a verse by verse commentary, very readable for the whole family or you could use it to teach through in your church uh, in, and yet I go into all of these issues uh, in detail. And so we've done what, three sessions, well one, two, this is fourth session if you count the question time. No, hang, how many times did I speak? Yeah, three yesterday. Fourth, we count the question time. But you will see in every session that I do, we're emphasizing what we're on about is the authority of the word of God, taking God at his word, not succumbing to the Genesis 3 attack to question God's word because of man's word. Remember the verse we started with, do not add to God's word. Very, very important. I'll hand back to Dr. Edison. I find myself always just amazed at the depth as well as the breadth of presentation that Brother Ham gives. I know that he has people who assist him in that process, but uh, what, a, what a wonderful blessing that God has provided to the body of Christ with someone who has given themselves to this consideration of God's authority, the Word of God. Uh, most of you on this campus, as campus family, know my favorite hymn is The Bible Stands like a rock undaunted, mid the raging storms of time. Pages burn with the truth eternal, glow with the light sublime. The Bible stands where the hills may tumble, firmly stand when the earth shall crumble. I will plant my feet on its firm foundation. Will you say that with me? I will plant my feet on its firm foundation, for the Bible stands. And so thank you so much, Brother Ham, and I trust that our hearts will be just strengthened in our commitment to the absolute authority and reliability of God's word. Uh, sometimes in my itinerancy of ministry, I'm in settings where folk will sort of express some kind of intimidation by intellects or persons of status who seem to question God's word. And as they talk with them, they feel a little out of place to discuss those thoughts with them. And I say, here's something you can always say accurately. I don't know what you're talking about, but if it isn't in agreement with the Word of God, you're wrong. And that sounds like a simple statement to someone that claims to be brilliant. But I can tell you without any apology, as we've heard so clearly this morning, God's Word is truth. And uh, thank the Lord for it. Uh, we're blessed to have the privilege of just even having those who have joined us online through these sessions. And I'd like to just say somewhat of a personal word of thanks to them as they join even as we're here in this gathering, appreciate their attendance. We've had just a wonderful interest in this. Uh, I've just received word uh, this morning of our folk who've been uh, gauging this, and we've had wonderful attendance online.
for these sessions as well. So would you just pray for God's blessing upon that? And those of you who have joined that way, it's a real joy to have you. Trust that you'll continue to just participate in these opportunities to share our campus with you if you use the vehicle of online for that opportunity.